being the first, you get to see how we do this slowly. There we go. These are camera accessories. They're, they're available in all different brands and everything. Our brand Explorer, we're going for the very, very high end. So everything is super high quality, very, very well made, looks good, matches the quality of your, of your camera, of your lenses. And we have compact tripods, soon to have full-size tripods. We have brackets for uh, horizontal and vertical um, positioning. Uh, excellent compact tripods, mobile phone holders, and uh, ball heads, and uh, an extremely good pair of lights uh, that are LED and RGB. LED is for um, doing more traditional photography where you're just using very accurate light rendering. Uh, it goes from 3000 Kelvin to 5500 Kelvin, which means from looking like a light bulb to looking like daylight. And then we have an RGB one, that's $109. The other one, by the way, is $99, a great value. Um, the RGB is $99 and it can do pretty much any color in the visible spectrum. It's, it's a pretty amazing light and it's not only a great photographic tool, but it, it, it's actually something that's a lot of fun to have for still photography, for video photography, for um, mobile photography, that kind of stuff. The batteries are built into it. They're very, very long life. The uh, LED one has four hours of life at full power. Uh, the RGB is a little bit less than that, but um, they're, they're, they're exceptional values uh, for camera accessories. Now, Nisi is a manufacturer in China and we are the exclusive distributor for that brand in the United States and also in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but Andrew, the gentleman who popped on for a little while there, uh, actually created that brand. Uh, he's got a family owned business in Australia. He's been in the business uh, an extremely long time, no, not as long as me, but I don't think anyone's been in the business as long as me that's still alive. And um, he, he knows being a photographer and being a business owner, a retailer and a distributor, he, he hears from all the different photographers around Australia what they want and what they see is lacking in, in gear that they have available to buy. And he's bringing those answers to Australia and now to the United States. And it's, it's a great brand. We literally just got it in last week. And I'm so impressed in what I'm seeing. And I can't wait for this to be in all your favorite stores. And of course, we'll be selling it ourselves. And by the way, if there's anything there that you really like, uh, you can get 15% off on Explorer as well. So please take a look at that. All right. Hi, Jose. How are you? Your timing is perfect. Hey. <laughs> and I like the shirt. Thank you. <laughs> um, we are sitting, flowers. We're sitting right here at we're sitting right here at five o'clock, so it's a perfect time to start. I've already done my whole big schmooze fest about uh, uh, you know ha hawking the items, so I'm going to turn it over to you, okay? And I will be going on mute, but I will be watching uh, chat. So if there's any questions, put them on chat. I'll convey them when I can. And uh, like I said, we'll also have time for a live Q&A at the end. Should run about 45 minutes to an hour. All righty. There you go, sir. Let me see here now. Give me just a second to uh, uh, get the screen share going here. Uh, I don't know what I did, what I did. Oh my goodness, this one passed me by. We have um, someone from Indonesia. How nice to uh, have you here. Thank you so much. Canada. 
Yeah, I'm seeing uh, Austin. A, a couple of people that I recognize as well from um, from here in the neighborhood. So, uh, hey, Charlie and Linda. And if there's anybody else that I know from Instagram or other uh, ways like that, I uh, apologize for not, not seeing the name on there. It looks like we're... Uh, We'll get we'll get to it later. So I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go mute on you and let you go. All right. Okay. Everybody seeing my screen? You seeing it there, Jim? Yes, I am seeing it. And if I'm seeing it, I would assume everyone else is seeing it. And if not, I'll watch it on. Uh, I'll I'll start seeing it on chat. Colombia. Jeez, Louise. We have someone from Colombia. And Montana too, that's almost as far away as Columbia for me. <laughs> All right, there you go, I'm going, bye. <laughs> All right. Guys, please keep your uh, cameras off, I would appreciate it. Mr. Curry, thank you. Miss Moses, thank you. All right, guys, sorry, I'm trying to adjust some things here on my view so that I can uh, see everything. Anyway, um, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, as well uh, at NISI. I really appreciate uh, you guys uh, inviting me again to do uh, this presentation of uh, poll Pollinators Magnified. Um, I uh, specialize in uh, a type of photography that I think a lot of people have gotten into in this last year uh, with, the, uh, with the age of COVID. Um, people not traveling as much. Um, it's uh, become a little bit more interesting to travel into your backyard and uh, I think Jim can attest and I've seen um, other manufacturers as well uh, selling out of products uh, for uh, macro photography uh, because a lot of people have really gotten into it. Um, like I said you can just go into your backyard and that's the thing that I, I fell in love with uh, macro photography uh, a few years ago um, and uh, it, it was I Prior to that, I was much more into portrait photography and landscape photography, but uh, once I uh, got into macro photography, um, I just, I love the fact that I didn't have to travel anywhere. I didn't have to worry about, um, you know, it, making any appointments or anything like that with, uh, with customers' portraits and things like that. So um, it very quickly became um, my, uh, my preferred uh, uh, niche within photography. So let me uh, go in, uh, go ahead and proceed here, uh, talking to you guys a little bit about myself. Um, already mentioned a few things about how long I've been doing macro photography. Um, but I've been a photographer all in all for about four years, although I've been a lifelong artist. Um, when I was a, a kid, um, actually before I even started grade school, I was very interested in drawing. And by the time I started kindergarten, I was already, I was pretty much the only kid in, in uh, kindergarten that was drawing full body people. Um, and by the time I was in middle school, I could do photorealistic drawing. And uh, so that uh, allowed me to get into more advanced uh, uh, art classes in high school. Um, but then I got more into music in my teenage years um, and wanted to pursue that kind of as my uh, artistic passion. Uh, but then ended up getting a, an unrelated degree, thinking that I needed to have a degree in, in a like a the, the backup job, um, and uh, ended up uh, having a good career uh, with the backup job, and, and kind of got away from my artistic interests. Uh, but a few years ago, um, my wife and I started traveling uh, quite a bit, and uh, we really enjoyed uh, visiting. Uh, national parks and things like that. And my wife always loved the photos that I would take uh, on my phone. And so for Christmas four years ago, she surprised me with uh, my first real camera and it was just instant love. And then about a year later, uh, the next Christmas, so exactly a year later, actually, um, she uh, she's an avid gardener and she asked me what kind of lens um, I needed in order to be able to um, take pictures of the, the flowers and the butterflies and things like that in her garden. And so I told her uh, to get me a macro lens and uh, I fully expected it to just be um, something that I would do a few pictures for her and then go back to my uh, more normal style of photography. But like I said uh, a few minutes ago, it was instant love. I, I felt for the first time uh, like I was really behaving like an artist, um, even though I had uh, previously had artistic um, intentions and um, 
wanted to be as creative as I could be with the camera. Um, I saw the immediate difference where I was a lot less in my head and was a lot more free to just try things. I, I just, I wanted to take pictures of, of anything and everything and not even worry about whether I got the settings right. I just wanted to take a picture and try it with this setting and then change this and see what I get there. And just that discovery um, of things up close and the details and being able to play around with the light and being able to do different things like that. I just, I was infatuated and I realized, like I said, that I was behaving like a, like a true creator versus a technician. And so uh, then a few months later, um, I was contacted when, uh, in, when the springtime came out and I started taking pictures of, of some of the bugs outside, the, uh, the bees particularly were something that I was really attracted to. And uh, the uh, editor of Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine reached out to me and wanted to use a few of my photos uh, for a story that they were doing. And so for me, in addition to my Instagram following responding really well, um, having a legitimate magazine like that contact me about using some of my work uh, was kind of the, the universe's way of telling me this is what you're supposed to be doing. You know, this is, uh, you've got a real knack for this. And so it, it pretty much has become my exclusive uh, style of, of photography. Um, I also, through the course of that article, ended up realizing that there's, uh, you know, a lot of our pollinators are in decline. And so it's become more than just an artistic pursuit, but it's really a, uh, a passion for inspiring um, people to care more about our vulnerable wildlife, uh, particularly with our pollinators and our native uh, species of pollinators and native uh, wildflowers and things like that. So, um, so enough about uh, my background. Um, let's uh, go ahead and get into the uh, what you guys came here for, which was to the, the tips for uh, photographing uh, these uh, oftentimes challenging subjects. And um, I always start off with uh, studying the subject. Um, I, I think a lot of people want, uh, almost always the question that gets asked uh, when somebody uh, likes one of my pictures on Instagram is what were your camera settings or which lens did you use? And um, the, the magic is not with the camera settings and the, the lens that you use, the magic is with understanding the subjects. And, um, you know, the, the camera settings, once you uh, get, you know, a couple of things, you can get things right technically in terms of exposure and, um, and light and all of that. But uh, to even be able to approach a, a certain subject like uh, this uh, dragonfly here, um, you, you need to uh, pay attention to things like, uh, like time of day. Uh, this one was uh, captured out early in the morning. Uh, they tend to move a lot slower in the morning when it's cooler, uh, particularly in early spring and late fall, um, you know, during the summer. Uh, if it's uh, pretty warm at night, they're going to be pretty active even very early in the morning. But in the springtime uh, and late fall, uh, take advantage of those cooler or early morning hours. And not only do they move a little bit slower, but a lot of times you'll catch them uh, with the dewdrops uh, forming on them. Uh, or uh, having developed on them overnight. So you can get some really cool uh, shots uh, to capture some unique uh, things that you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, another uh, thing in addition to uh, time of day that you need to think about uh, is, is the weather. Uh, so this one you might think, uh, this wasp shot here, you might think was uh, uh, that dew drops again, but this was actually after rain. And so it, it creates a very similar effect. And so rain and cooler weather that they will basically find a, a flower or something to perch on and uh, they'll sit there and wait the rain out. Um, and then uh, you can uh, take advantage of that moment. Um, and this, this particular morning was, uh, was pretty cool as well. I photographed this one in uh, November uh, of last year. Uh, it was really uh, towards the end of the season. That's one nice thing about Texas is that even despite the fact that we had a crazy uh, cold snap last week, that's very unusual. We usually have a very long uh, summer and, uh, you know, very, very good weather for shooting about nine to 10 months of the year. But this was a pretty cool morning. And so, uh, and it had been raining. And so, like I said, this, uh, this bug right here was, uh, uh, drying off and it gave me an opportunity to capture quite a few shots. Um, I will say also this one uh, was captured using the telephoto lens uh, 
uh, with the Nisi uh, 77 millimeter on it at, at that combo uh, for that. And so I, I, I like showing this one as a good example of the, the level of, of detail and uh, sharpness that you can achieve uh, with that setup. I've, I've, that's a question a lot of people have asked me because I, I primarily shoot, uh, and I'll uh, show that in uh, other pictures coming up, but I primarily shoot with my macro lens and then use the Nisi for additional magnification. But the, the way that uh, they had originally designed this lens was um, to go on a telephoto lens and, and turn it into a macro lens. And uh, it, I, I prefer to use it the other way, but um, like I said, I, I like that I have this option uh, as well. If I'm shooting with my telephoto lens out in the field and want to very quickly do a macro shot, I have uh, the ability to just thread that onto the end of the telephoto lens and uh, be able to capture something up close. Um, so in addition to the weather, um, some things to pay attention to with the subjects uh, are mating behaviors. Um, one of the things that I'm most known for with my macro photography, there's a lot of really great macro photographers uh, these days, and a lot of people have uh, learned um, how to uh, properly uh, light subjects and things like that, which is very important. I'll get more into the technical stuff later. But uh, with me, one of the things that I've uh, really carved out a, a niche for spe uh, specifically in macro is with flying insects. And uh, they're really, really difficult to catch. And, and I'll tell you, even after three years of uh, photographing insects, um, the thing that I've uh, developed most is not um, speed and quickness, but it's more of a, a, a sense of what to uh, look for. Um, so like with this one, this is a, actually a male uh, queen dragonfly. And uh, the, uh, when, they're, when the males are uh, looking for a female, uh, they'll, it, try, they'll hover behind the female and just kind of bounce up and down a little bit. And when you see that, if you're quick enough to get over there before they move on to another flower, because the, they basically do that while the female is feeding on a flower, uh, trying to entice her. Uh, if you're quick enough to get around to the right angle, and then you can line up uh, for your shot and uh, be able to capture uh, a moment like this um, a little bit more easily. It's still hard. Um, uh, definitely, I had to fire off quite a few shots to get this, this one where I nailed it right on the forehead. Um, you get a lot of shots where you nail it more on the back of the wings or something. And, uh, and so uh, it still takes uh, precision and accuracy and anticipation as well. Uh, all that comes only with time, but like I said, most importantly um, is to observe the, the insects enough that you get to know when they're gonna be moving a little bit more slowly um, or hovering in place or uh, just uh, acting in a way that allows you to uh, capture them instead of, uh, instead of trying to chase them from one flower to the next. That's, that's really, really hard. Um, the uh, next thing, uh, patrolling behaviors. Uh, this guy here, um, I captured, this is a male um, horsefly-like carpenter bee. And uh, I captured him while he was uh, guarding a, a nest. I noticed that uh, carpenter bees in particular, the males, uh, when they are uh, it, looking for a mate, uh, they'll find a nest and they'll, they'll kind of stand guard around it and chase off. Uh, other, any, really anything that comes close, they'll chase you, they'll try to chase you off, but you don't have to worry about them because the males don't have stingers. Um, but because it was uh, basically just kind of hovering back and forth, just kind of floating along like this, a little more slowly and turning and um, you still have to get the, uh, the timing right. And um, if you guys have been doing macro uh, for any uh, period of time, you know that even just uh, the difference of a of a few millimeters can make the difference between a shot that looks right and a shot that looks wrong. You got to nail it right on the eyes, right on the forehead um, to have a shot that looks uh, right, that looks sharp and that looks um, properly composed. And so again there, like I said, I was able to uh, line up this shot like that by paying attention to when uh, they were moving uh, a little bit more uh, in a way that made the shot a little bit more possible. Um, also visiting popular flowers, um, this shot here, not in flight, uh, this is a, a male Eastern carpenter bee, uh, but I do have some pretty cool shots. Um, I think I've got one a little bit later on uh, of this guy, but uh, the Eastern carpenter bee was actually the first bee uh, photo that I captured 
uh, in flight that I was really um, excited about um, because it, it was that was when I had that aha moment about how it was guarding that nest and just kind of it, it, it might fly off every now and then, but for the most part, would come back to a certain general area, like a little three foot uh, diameter area that it would just hover back and forth around and, and like I said, make an impossible shot possible. Uh, but uh, sometimes, uh, you know, composing them with a flower mix uh, for a, a really uh, cute shot or a pretty shot. Um, and so uh, finding flowers that, that they are, uh, that are heavy in pollen um, they tend to spend a little bit more time on those. They cover themselves in a little bit of pollen. And, um, you know, so the, those are uh, some good uh, opportunities to take shots. Also, when they cover themselves in pollen, they'll, uh, particularly honeybees do this a lot. I've seen it more in honeybees than just about any other type of bee, where they'll, uh, there's a couple of types of flowers. Um, the uh, passion uh, vine flowers, and uh, white poppies uh, are the ones that I look for the most because I've seen uh, this behavior quite a bit on those flowers. And that's where they'll get down, they get themselves just covered in pollen and then they'll pop up off the flower and clean it off. You know, they have those little pollen baskets on their legs and they basically brush it all down onto the pollen baskets. And while they're hovering above the flower, you get some really great opportunities for some, some really cool shots. Uh, while they're floating uh, just kind of in that one spot. Again, like I said, it still takes timing and precision and practice, but it's, it's just a lot more easy than, uh, than chasing them around. Also returning to a perch, uh, particularly with dragonflies, this is one of the things that you need to um, be aware of is that uh, they're, most dragonflies are pretty elusive. They don't like you approaching them. Um, but I've found uh, one thing that helps is approaching them dead on. Um, Dragonflies and most insects have additional eyes called ocelli. You can see uh, in the middle of, of its forehead, the, the little white eye, and then there's two black ones on either side. And ocelli basically uh, detect movement primarily. And so they're really, really good at, at seeing you when you're moving. But if you come straight forward at them, um, they don't sense that as much as if you're moving laterally or diagonally. So. Um, think about that and, and approach very slowly as you come in towards them. And if they fly off, just uh, kind of stand still and wait for them to come back. Uh, very often they'll come back if you, uh, if you just stop moving and wait there for a minute or two. Um, this particular species, a Halloween pennant, uh, was one that I uh, tried for in my first two seasons uh, doing macro photography and I could never get close enough to get a, a good macro shot. And uh, finally last year, I was able to get the shot. And what made the difference for, for this one was that instead of approaching it on my feet, I got down on uh, hands and knees and crawled towards it uh, that way and still inching you know, a few inches at a time. And that was finally the, the trick. It, it, it seemed to not mind me approaching from a lower angle because it was up on this tall uh, dead uh, grass that was uh, there in the ground or a, a, some type of uh, dead brush or whatever. But anyway, it was at about, about two and a half to three feet high. And so crawling in at it like that at uh, the same angle or a little bit below uh, allowed me to approach it. And so these are the, again, the types of things that you need to think about. And there's no um, one answer uh, for all species. And even, uh, you know, species within a family of insects, like with dragonflies, some of them are, have no problem at all with you approaching. Some are uh, actually even a little bit inquisitive. I've had some that will fly at me and tap me on my shoulder as I'm taking pictures and then go back to their perch and take, let me take a few more pictures. And then I've had some others like this Halloween pennant that just do not want you to get anywhere near close to them. So um, you just gotta spend a little bit of time out in the field and, and observe. Uh, don't go and just immediately start shooting. You know, it, it's, um, I've compared it before, like with uh, landscape photography, um, that if you're doing landscape photography and if you really want an amazing shot, you've got to go at the right time of day or, or in the right conditions, maybe um, with a storm brewing in the background. If you just go out at two o'clock in the afternoon, um, it's, there's not really going to be uh, likely a, a very good, compelling opportunity uh, for, a, for a beautiful composition 
like you get when you capture a sunrise or a sunset or, you know, and the, the light that, that that time of day creates. And so you got to think the same thing with the insects, you know, you can't, you might get lucky, uh, you might get out there and just uh, get a shot, um, you know, your very first time or, you know, every now and then, but if you really want to consistently take good photos, you got to spend a little bit of time observing. I, I would always tell a photographer, you know, take, take 10, 15 minutes before you even take your first shot and just kind of watch them for a little bit and see what they're doing. And you'll start noticing um, little opportunities here and there. Um, also uh, approaching a nest. This is uh, a uh, sand wasp here that was uh, building a nest in the, in the ground. They like the sandy soil, which uh, we have here in Texas. And uh, I noticed it came back a couple of times uh, as it was digging out a little hole uh, down into the ground. And so I laid down on the ground in front of it uh, uh, one of the times that it flew off and just waited for it to come back and uh, managed to, uh, I needed uh, about two or three attempts uh, of it leaving and coming back before I really nailed that perfect shot right on the forehead. Um, because uh, even, you know, coming in, they, they'll, they'll hover in one spot and then drop and then hover for a second or two and drop again. And so um, your timing still has to be perfect. But um, like I said, again, it's just more possible if you know when and where to look for them. I actually was able to also get around to this side. As those of you that follow me on Instagram know, I just posted a, a, a side view of this uh, uh, sand wasp uh, yesterday, and uh, it was uh, it was it was pretty cool. It was this was actually the first insect that I photographed using um, the uh, the diffused flash and Nisi on my uh, 90 millimeter macro combo. So I'm literally uh, less than maybe six to eight inches away from it. Uh, I was really close to this subject. And so they, uh, that makes it that much harder as well. I, I, in previous years, I, for my flying insects, I focused primarily using my telephoto lens and then it would crop in uh, quite a bit uh, because it was just easier to shoot them from a little bit further away. But as my um, sense of anticipation got better and you know, getting to, to know the movements and all that better. I've gotten to where now I can capture them like this with a macro lens and a, uh, and flash, which the other thing about flat with the telephoto lens from a little further away and natural light, I could use continuous shutter and, you know, rattle off about four or five shots and just pick the best one of those. But with this, you get one click with that flash and, uh, and then you got to click again um, and, and refocus and click again. And so it's uh, definitely a little bit more challenging, but a lot of fun for me, especially since I'd gotten really uh, quite good at capturing them with natural light. Um, it was fun to, to kind of find a new challenge uh, with this. And, uh, and I think this season I'm gonna uh, attempt uh, adding some strobes as well. So uh, be on the lookout for that this, uh, this summer from me. Um, the other thing that, uh, you need to think about um, for good photography, you don't wanna just um, take a, a picture of the subject without thinking about the scene. Um, now, sometimes if you're just wanting to document the subject or if you want a very minimal shot, you can do that. I mean, I do that a lot. That's actually one of my uh, main styles actually is to do a very minimalist uh, shot of the insect in flight with just a very clean background. But if you're wanting to sell your photos, uh, which I really got into uh, two years ago, COVID uh, kind of hurt that a little bit, but I started doing some different uh, events, uh, festivals and things like that and selling prints and realizing that, that people, uh, when they're buying art for their home, they want something uh, that's uh, a little prettier of a composition than not necessarily just a, a big flying insect for the wall. So uh, you have to think about, uh, things like uh, angle of light, like in this shot here, um, and also rule of thirds, uh, you've got both things uh, illustrated here. The light was actually behind the subject and then I used the flash to light up the subject, but uh, the, the background light from the sun created a really nice uh, rim light. Um, and so it really made uh, for a, a pretty, uh, lighting on the B uh, between the, the flash on the front and the, uh, the rim on the back. 
but then also the way that it made the um, this this their borage uh, flowers, it really made them uh, glow and glisten, and so uh, and created a nice deep blue background. So um, you not always going to see that uh, eyeballing it uh, until you've uh, been shooting for a while, and then you can kind of start having an idea of what you're going to see through the lens. But sometimes you just have to get in there and experiment, look through the lens, and uh, and ask yourself, you know, does the scene excite you? And uh, and then you'll also still have to experience, if you're using flash, you'll have to experiment a little bit with getting your exposure right uh, so that you include the background or so that the background is black, just depending on what your goal is for the shot. Um, in addition to uh, rule of thirds, other things to think about are point of view and symmetry. Um, this uh, was another, uh, a really cool uh, dragonfly is a carmine skimmer. Um, uh, this one was actually a little bit more friendly than that Halloween uh, pennant, but still, you know, like like I said, like most dragonflies, uh, fairly elusive. But uh, this shot was fr taken from above, um, so this is a bit of a topside shot and um, really gave a a really cool dramatic uh, look because it was again up on a uh, twig a couple of feet off the ground, so the background was completely black. The flash couldn't reach all the way to the to the ground and against that deep uh, red um, and then just that that real centered balance uh, with the uh, the wings outstretched as well it just created a really cool uh, centered composition so even though the last one illustrated the rule of thirds um, you know although there's some elements of rule of thirds in here don't let those rules be uh, the thing that controls you always think look and um, make your composition based off of what looks exciting to you. Um, don't, if you can't find something exciting, then try playing with the rule of thirds, try playing with the, the lines and the light and see if you find something that's a little bit more exciting to you. Um, you can use those, um, those rules to, to help you if you're not finding something that you like. But I, I always uh, follow my heart and uh, take a picture that um, is, uh, that makes me say, wow, or that just uh, really um, blows me away in some uh, form or fashion. Um, additionally, uh, find a, a clean or a complementary background. I talked about that a little bit earlier with sometimes just a, a clean background on the flying insects, um, but sometimes a complementary background like with this white uh, leaf footed bug um, on a, a pink and white uh, zinnia flower, it uh, really made for a, a really pretty composition. The other thing here, um, it's uh, this I learned uh, through portrait photography, and uh, it's pretty much true with any time that you're taking um, living uh, creatures, is that you always want to focus on the eyes. Um, if you miss the focus, uh, then like if I was focused on the antlers uh, or the uh, antenna, rather, it would uh, uh, look out of focus. Um, our eyes are drawn to the eyes of other creatures and um, it, it makes the image look, uh, look properly uh, focused if you uh, focus on the eyes. So, so think about that when you're capturing um, photos. So like even when you start attempting the, uh, the flying insects, um, you know, go take enough pictures that you find the ones that where the focus is is on the eyes rather than just on its tail or on some other part of the body, um, because that's the one that that's going to be the the wow shot. Um, additionally, uh, depth of field. Um, this is a and leading lines. Uh, this one illustrates kind of both here. Um, you know, you've got some the leading lines of the wings. I like that X wing pose. Um, it's one of my favorite um, ways to capture them, uh, although uh, you don't get to choose how it's going to capture. It's just the luck of the moment um, when you snap, but if you can capture them like that with the X wings, it, it really makes for a compelling image, drawing your eyes right to the, uh, uh, to the subject's eyes. And then that depth of field where how the way that it fades out in the background, again, all, all of these, those elements work together to kind of pull your eye right to uh, the, the eyes of the subject and tell the viewer, uh, so the person who's looking at your picture, what they should focus on. And this is a damselfly. This one was captured with the uh, telephoto lens without the macro lens on there. This was uh, 
before I had uh, the uh, the Nisi lens um, option, but uh, it was pretty cool uh, composition actually in a field rather than uh, next to a, a pond. Um, another thing to think about with the scene, uh, texture and patterns and, and then just uh, beauty, you know, think about things, um, basic uh, principles of beauty. Um, the uh, the colors, uh, the pinks and the purples and the yellows, you know, try to um, bring in some really nice colors, um, getting the exposure right so that it in, uh, really shows those colors nicely um, so that you don't have harsh contrast. Um, all those things uh, have an impact on what is uh, the way that your image is perceived uh, as well. Even little things like, um, the bee is just feeding on this flower and it's not posing for me, but it, it looks like it's posing for it. It looks kind of like it's looking at the camera kind of out of the corner of its eye, a little bit coyly. And so uh, think about those things when you uh, take pictures, you know, take, I, I took, you know, probably a couple dozen shots of this bee as it was crawling around on this flower and uh, thinking a little bit more about lining myself up right so that the background had uh, the, the purple flowers in the background. But then afterwards, going through and, and looking for the ones where I really uh, felt something uh, special about the the pose that the uh, that the bee had, that's just as important as anything else compositionally, and, and probably the most important thing since that's where you want the uh, the viewer looking at your your picture. Um, so tip three is understanding your equipment. Um, as, as well as understanding your uh, settings, you need to know uh, the capabilities of your equipment, like how many megapixels your camera has. Um, if you don't have a lot of megapixels, um, you're not going to be able to uh, crop uh, very much. I have uh, with the Sony a7R 3 I have 42 megapixels, so I can crop quite a bit. The downside, though, is that um, more megapixels adds more noise. So if you're shooting at high ISO levels, you're definitely going to have more noise to contend with. So if you tend to um, not need to crop very much and you uh, want to be able to shoot in lower light settings without having to deal with noise and, and cropping, um, then less megapixels might uh, be better for you. Um, full frame versus crop sensor. Um, Full frame gives you a little bit more dynamic range. So think about that. Um, all that means really is that um, if you're shooting with a crop sensor, you have to be that much more careful that your exposure is right, that you have enough light uh, to light up the shadows um, because it's not gonna have as, as easy of a time bringing up the details in the shadows or you know it's gonna blow out the highlights as well a little bit more easily. So just know the limitations of your uh, camera and equipment. Working and focusing distance. Um, if you're buying a lens uh, to do a certain type of uh, photography, um, but then you can't get close enough to the subject or, uh, to get the types of pictures that you want, then that's going to be an issue. So pay attention to that. Um, when I'm using the uh, the Sony with the uh, Nisi attached to it, it actually reduces the working distance. Um, which I actually like. Um, I've actually ended up preferring um, to uh, the uh, that having the full range when I'm doing close-up uh, macro photography like that of the flying insects because it works a bit like a focus limiter. Um, there's uh, three settings on this lens. If any of you have the Sony lens, you know that that there's three settings for distance. One is um, the the shortest distance, um, about a uh, uh, it, the the meter to three meters, and then from three meters to infinity, and then full range. And um, I would almost never use that um, that three meter uh, to infinity range because it would tend to hunt too far in the distance. Well, with the Nisi attachment, it doesn't allow it to hunt uh, very far away because the, the mag extra magnification limits how far it's gonna be able to focus uh, away. And so it actually um, makes it a little bit easier for your camera to kind of know where uh, you're wanting to, uh, to get your focus. Um, knowing the sharpest range of your lenses is also important. You guys will notice that I'm almost always shooting at F10. I've found that to be with my lenses, uh, kind of the sweet spot uh, where you get um, really sharp and good depth of field uh, with the subject, 
and enough light that you don't have to crank up the ISO too much. Um, so knowing that sharpest range, um, manual mode versus auto mode. Um, I'm always shooting in manual mode. I'll use autofocus for uh, flying insects, but as far as the, uh, the shooting mode, it's always manual mode because I, um, I always want control of, uh, complete control of the exposure. Um, if you're uh, shooting in one of the auto uh, modes like uh, aperture priority or, sh or shutter priority, then you're letting the camera pretty much decide what is the right exposure. And uh, sometimes it'll get it right, but sometimes it won't. Like in the, the picture that I showed uh, earlier of the, uh, the bee um, with, the, with the dark background, I have another one where the background is almost completely black. Um, and if, if, it, if the camera sees that and you're working in auto mode, um, then it's gonna try to brighten everything up and it'll overexpose the subject. So um, I always shoot in manual mode, um, set the, the ISO to auto so that it can adjust there, but then compensate for the subject. So limit how far it can go with that ISO. Um, and, uh, and then, like I said, adjust it uh, according to, to the subject, not to the background. Um, understanding the differences of a telephoto versus a prime. A telephoto is going to give you a lot more uh, working uh, range. Um, obviously, you can shoot at different focal lengths, but they're usually not as sharp as a, as a prime lens. A prime lens is going to be a lot more sharp, uh, typically. Uh, natural light versus uh, flash. Um, this is a natural light shot. Uh, you can see that, that the highlights are a little bit hotter on the, the eyes than on some of the previous uh, dragonfly photos that, that I've shown. When you're using flash, you, uh, especially if you have a good conical diffuser, like I'll, I'll uh, show you guys in a, in a little bit, um, you can get softer highlights and uh, better lighting on the shadows. Um, but natural light is gonna give you um, a more natural looking background. Um, so uh, you just have to decide what your goal is for the shot. Um, this one also is really nice with the leading lines, kind of draws your eye there, a little bit of rule of thirds. So a couple of things to think about there. So here is the same dragonfly that you just saw, or not the exact same one, but the same species uh, and on a similar plant. And whereas that one was a natural light shot, this is a uh, shot with uh, diffused flash. And you can see just how much uh, more even the lighting is. You don't have the, those bright hot spots on the eyes. Um, you're also able to get a lot more uh, detail uh, in the image when you uh, control the exposure like that. So again, each one has its place. You know, don't decide that you need to shoot one way or the other. Um, shoot both and, and just see kind of what you like and uh, let, the, uh, let the moment kind of dictate um, how you're gonna, how you're gonna shoot. Uh, for, uh, for my own personal macro setup, like I mentioned already, I use the Sony a7R3. Um, and uh, I primarily use the, uh, the Sony uh, 90 millimeter macro lens, uh, but I also have a 50 millimeter uh, macro lens. Here's uh, that 50 millimeter. Um, it's a, uh, it is an autofocus lens, but it's a little bit clunky. It, it's a little bit of a slower focuser. Um, if you guys know the difference between a, uh, a wider angle, like uh, Jim was talking about at the beginning of the presentation, that new 15 millimeter uh, lens that Nisi came out with, which I'll be trying out very soon. I actually uh, am excited to uh, uh, give it a little test here. And, and especially when the fl when flowers come out, uh, I can't wait to uh, do some, uh, some photography uh, with a, an extreme wide angle like that, um, focusing on, on up close uh, uh, subjects. Um, seeing what I can do with that. But anyway, with the 50 millimeter, um, you definitely get a more wide angle look than you do with the 90 millimeter. Um, but it, it's a little bit slower uh, focusing. And oh, and as far as that, that wider angle look, basically think of it like that it, it tends to exaggerate the features uh, that are um, closest to the camera uh, of the subject. So um, I'll show some pictures a little bit later to kind of give you an idea of, of what that ends up looking like. Um, I use the, the Nisi uh, close-up lens kit um, on the end of the camera, and uh, I, I have both the 77 and the 58, um, but uh, uh, the 77, um, I think I use a, a, a little bit more often. Like I said, this is really my preferred setup right here, the 90 millimeter with the 77 
for the majority of, of my shooting um, because I, I do a lot of the, the flying insects. But if it's a stationary subject, the 58 actually gives you more magnification. Uh, it has uh, more diopters, so you get more magnification and so you can get more detail, but you get less working distance, uh, quite a bit less working distance. So it's a little bit harder to uh, do flying uh, insects with the 58 than it is with the uh, with the 77. Now that's not as big of a deal when you're using it in combination with the telephoto lens because with the telephoto lens, you just adjust the uh, the focal length um, to the the right focal length to get to one to one or whatever magnification you want. Um, with a with the 77 on a telephoto at 200 millimeters, you uh, you end up with one to one magnification. And I believe with the 58, if I remember correctly, uh, it's at 120 millimeters. I'll let Jim correct me later if I got that wrong. Uh, the um, flash, I use the Godox uh, V862 uh, flash. I don't have any kind of relationship with Godox, but that is what I use. Um, it's a fairly inexpensive flash with a really, really uh, fast recycle time. It uses uh, lithium ion batteries. And so I like uh, that they're rechargeable and powerful and uh, you know, like really fast recycle time. So um, I can uh, click uh, one right after another very quickly. Um, I also use the, uh, the AK light diffuser. Uh, there's a guy here in, uh, in the US uh, out of Florida. Uh, I do have a relationship with him so I can help you guys with getting that, uh, the AK light diffuser as well. Uh, if you wanna hit me up after the uh, workshop, uh, after the webinar tonight, um, but, um, that's a really phenomenal, I used, to, I had my own DIY diffuser, uh, for a while and, uh, was really happy with it. It, it gave me similar results, um, uh, in the photo, but required more power because it didn't, um, brighten the light as much and didn't diffuse it as well. And this, uh, diffuser really does a phenomenal job. Um, here's the front view of that. Uh, really does a phenomenal job. And basically what a con conical diffuser does, uh, think about it like an umbrella uh, for portrait photography. It basically spreads the light so that it, it hits the subject really softly. It also makes it larger so you don't have um, any, uh, any harsh shadows or anything like that and, and just real smooth, even light. So uh, that's basically what it also brings it closer to the subject. The further away you are from the subject, um, the more harsh the shadows are gonna be. So the closer that you can bring the light to the subject, um, the, the better diffusion you're gonna get. Um, I also uh, do macro, pseudo macro with my uh, uh, 100 to 400 and a 1.4 teleconverter. So I'm, when I use that setup, I'm typically shooting at about 560 millimeters. Um, I, this was my preferred uh, setup for flight photography and for certain subjects it, it still will be it kind of has to be like with dragonflies um, it's a little bit more difficult to get up close to them uh, because they don't typically hover above a flower or something like that there's a few moments and I'll, I'll get into those a little bit later mating for example dragonflies will uh, hover above a female a lot of times when after they've mated and the female is uh, depositing the eggs and the male will, will hover above her to guard her from other males uh, that'll try to uh, swoop in and, and uh, uh, take her. And, and really interesting fact about them actually is that they, uh, uh, the males can actually scoop out the, uh, the sperm of the previous male and put their own sperm in there. And so uh, they guard uh, very uh, viciously uh, against that. Uh, but like I said, um, that's one of the uh, moments that I've utilized uh, for capturing dragonflies in flight uh, is when they're, they're guarding over a female like that. Um, but like I said, e even with that, you having to get as close as you do with the macro setup and, and diffused flash uh, is definitely a challenge. That's another thing though, that one of my goals for this summer, uh, in addition to using strobes uh, for uh, lighting up some shots is getting that uh, flash and diffuser uh, for an extreme close-up uh, macro uh, flight shot of a dragonfly or a damselfly. Um, I do also use the, uh, the Nisi uh, close-up lens on the end, as I showed you guys uh, a couple of pictures earlier, that wasp, for example. Um, and I used diffuse flash with that. I was able to attach the same uh, setup there. 
you do have to shoot from a little bit farther away um, with the telephoto lens, the working distance is different and you just have to get used to that, that difference. But also <clears throat> if you have the, uh, the teleconverter, uh, that 1.4 additional magnification, you need to take that off because a uh, combination of that and the, the Nisi is too much and you end up with really uh, soft, you end up with diffraction and really soft images. And so um, if you're going to attach it there, you want to make sure you don't have any additional teleconverters on your, uh, on your lens. This here is a shot, uh, a, an example of how I uh, captured. This is almost the entire frame um, cropped in here, just, just a little bit on the edges. Um, but uh, this was uh, with the Sony a7R III, like I said, is my camera. This one was shot at 560 millimeters with that combo with the uh, telephoto lens and the 1.4 teleconverter. Um, my preferred settings, as you can see here, um, are at f10 and uh, at 1 1600th of a second when I'm shooting natural light. That's kind of my starting point, uh, but I'll slow down to as slow as 1 800th of a second um, and go as fast as 1 2000th or 1 2500th of a second, just depending on how much natural light I have and, uh, and how much I want to either um, crank up the ISO or not crank up the ISO. So um, this is a, a natural light shot and a good example of where I had a really bright background. And, uh, and even though I did adjust the exposure compensation to, for the subject, I was still a little bit under and had to fix that a little bit in post-processing where I had to bring up the, the shadows and uh, blacks in the, in the face. Um, because it was just such a bright background that the and the subject was uh, facing away from the sun. So, um, you know, you, you got to think about those things in uh, depending on what your setup is. Zoom in here just a little bit closer. And so that was that was a pretty cool uh, shot. This uh, subject was maybe five or six feet away from me, uh, paused for just a second. Um, and I was able to snap off two or three shots. Um, real quickly there, I got that X-wing pose. Uh, this is a, another uh, sh shot with the telephoto lens and another good example of why I always recommend shooting in um, manual mode. Um, with that dark of a background, if you're um, using auto, it's going to overexpose the subject and try to make the background. This was a line of trees um, to, the, uh, to the back of the subject uh, maybe 20, 30 feet uh, back uh, behind the subject. And so um, by exposing properly for, for the subject, uh, which was in a little bit more light, um, I essentially made the background black like that. And, um, you know, so as you can see my settings there, the F10 and 1 1600th and the ISO auto, uh, but compensated, you know, ends up with a much lower ISO than it would have tried to do. Um, had I left it on auto, completely on auto. And there's a uh, close up there. So you guys can see just the, you know, still getting really good level of detail. Not, not quite as good as you get with a, with a prime or with a, a macro uh, close up. Part of it is just, you know, the fact that you have to crop a little bit more when you're shooting like this. But um, here's another uh, example with the uh, telephoto plus the Nisi. Um, the, here I'm shooting with the a7R III again, the 100 to 400 telephoto lens and uh, the Nisi add-on. <clears throat> I'm at f10 again, but now I'm shooting at 1 200th of a second using the uh, diffuse flash. And uh, you can see I, I, here I don't use auto ISO. I control the ISO myself depending on how much of the background I want uh, or how much X, if it's the subject is, uh, is particularly dark, you, you'll need to adjust. Um, some subjects have really dark features. If they have brighter features or shinier features, you just kind of got to play around a little bit and, and adjust for that a little bit more ISO and a little bit, uh, or a little bit slower shutter speed, uh, can help you with some of those, uh, some of those things. Come in a little bit closer here and you can see the, uh, the level of detail. Um, again, like I said, with, this is the, uh, the telephoto lens. Um, with the uh, with the Nisi uh, combo on there, so you can really get uh, good true macro photography uh, with that uh, combination. 
this is another one, uh, same thing, uh, a little bit of a darker subject, a little bit less shiny. And so um, had to bring down the, uh, the shutter speed a little bit to get it uh, properly exposed. Um, this is a hoverfly. Um, again, really nice uh, detail in there on the eyes. Um, that's one of the things uh, with macro photography, uh, what you usually one of the things that draws you to macro photography is being able to see those details, not only to be able to see things that you can't really see all that well with the naked eye, but just to be able to see the level of detail. So think about that as you're doing macro photography. Um, this photo here, um, this year I, I started uh, doing more photography, um, like I said, with the 90 millimeter and the Nisi and diffused flash. And uh, one of the things that um, I really love about this shot is that I was able to freeze the wings as well. Um, and the, the wings, so what's interesting is that when I'm shooting in natural light, I'm typically needing to be at like 1 1600th of a second or 1 1250th of a second or faster to freeze the wings. And even then, sometimes you don't always catch it um, at the right moment to, to freeze it. It looks a little blurred. Um, but with uh, when you're shooting with flash, uh, the flash actually, uh, depending on the power that you have the, uh, the flash set at, um, the flash actually has a duration. And uh, so it's called referred to as tea time. And I had learned this uh, a few years ago, uh, watching on um, Creative Live, a tutorial on uh, shooting, uh, photographing people uh, in action and uh, how you can freeze motion either with shutter speed or with flash. And so I learned that the, the tea time, if you have it uh, at at least one five thousandth or one six thousandth of a, of a second, then it's going to, uh, you can have the shutter open as long, uh, you know, as, as much as you want um, and still freeze the motion as long as you don't get ambient light on the subject. So um, if the subject would be in shadow naturally or, or almost black um, and only the flash uh, lights it up, then um, like I said, at uh, one, four, one five thousandth of a second or a little bit faster, you're going to be able to freeze, completely freeze the subject. And so for this one, now you'll say, well, where, what is that tea time? Um, some flashes have uh, uh, specification guides, uh, some don't, the one that I have doesn't, but um, I know just from trial and error and from what other flash, most flashes, uh, most uh, speed lights like that have very similar settings. And I learned that somewhere between about one eighth and one sixteenth of a second um, is kind of that sweet spot. And uh, anything faster than 1 16th um, is going to only uh, work that much more. Now you're reducing the amount of, of light as well. So you need to find a good balance there. But for this subject here in flight, captured it at 1 250th of a second, which if, if I had been shooting with natural light at 1 250th of a second, wouldn't have been frozen at all. It would have been a blur. Um, and so uh, or it would have been dark. And so uh, that combination like that uh, is what allowed me to capture not only the subject, but the wing uh, nice and crisp like that. Zoom in here just a, a bit for you guys to uh, check out that, that level of detail um, that you're able to get with this combination like that. The, uh, the Sony 90 millimeter macro lens with the Nisi uh, combo. And, and I, I'm saying Sony because that's what I shoot with, but if you uh, with shoot Nikon or Canon, you probably have like a 100 or a 105 uh, millimeter macro lens. And as long as you get a good reputable brand, uh, most macro lenses are gonna be really, really sharp. They're usually some of the sharpest lenses uh, that, that you can buy from any manufacturer. So don't think that just because I keep saying Sony, that's what I shoot with. Uh, it doesn't have to be Sony, um, but the, the combination with the Nisi does, like I said, give you that additional magnification and also uh, works like a focus limiter so that you can, uh, your, your uh, autofocus doesn't hunt uh, too far back. And it just kind of keeps it within a certain range and makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to lock focus. Um, I do use, um, I'll talk about that real quick. I use uh, with flying subjects, I use spot uh, lock autofocus. 
Um, and I use the smallest spot possible so that it, again, so that it, I can select the subject. It's still, I always compare it to uh, balancing a pencil on the tip of your finger. It's still really challenging um, to get that subject centered right in on that spot. When it's, even when it's hovering, it's not like a static hover. It, it's bouncing around like this and, and moving. So um, you uh, reduce the range and definitely increase your odds, but it's still, um, you gotta be still very precise and have your timing and anticipation down to where you're clicking almost before it comes into focus. You kind of gotta, as you get a feel, you start knowing whether it's coming towards you or away from you and if it's about to be in focus or not, because if you wait until it's in focus, you'll be too late. You kind of got to click as it, it is about to be in focus and, and then you'll nail that, that shot like that. Um, <clears throat> here's another example of a stationary subject uh, with the Nisi uh, and 90 millimeter uh, macro combo. <clears throat> this one, obviously not in flight, um, but um, still you know, a good example of the, the level of, of detail. So with the 77 millimeter, I was mentioning earlier that you get uh, not as much additional magnification as you do with the 58. Uh, I'll tell you guys right now with the 77 by my test, you get about on a 90 millimeter macro, you get about 30% additional magnification. And with the 58, you get about 65% additional magnification. So think of it as like a 1.3 to one uh, ratio uh, with the 77 or a 1.65 to one with the uh, 58 millimeter. And that's of course gonna change whether you have a 90 or whether you have a 105 or whether you're shooting with a telephoto. Again, um, the, the prime lens is gonna uh, kind of dictate exactly how much magnification you end up with. Um, so you'll just have to experiment a little bit with your, uh, uh, with your setup. Here's a, an example um, of a, a damselfly uh, that I was so excited to get this year because this is one that I had tried for uh, the year before <clears throat> and I was never able to get up close enough to get a true one-to-one. -one. And by using the combo with the 58 and the 90 millimeter, I was able to capture it at actually even better than one-to-one -one because two things happened for this shot. One, um, I was able to uh, not have to be as close to get uh, one to one, but this one was was mating. And as you notice, he's not holding anything with his hands. So what the o Odinates do, like dragonflies and damselflies, is they'll grab the female by the back of the head and uh, lead her around the pond, and then she'll deposit the eggs into the uh, into the water. With uh, damselflies, the male will keep holding on. Uh, to to her and so and typically they'll land on a blade of grass where both of them can grab on but in this one that's actually uh, the the female a little bit that you're seeing underneath him in in the orange there um, she's uh, in in blur in the background and he's just floating in space and so it was a little bit of a flight shot and uh, and so I was able to get uh, extra close and I think I got this one uh, if I remember correctly right at uh, one to one. And then with that 58, it was a, about a 1.65 to one, because this is a really tiny subject. This, uh, this guy is maybe 15 millimeters long. And so the width of the head is maybe two millimeters. Um, it's a, if you guys have, uh, shot damselflies, you know what they're, what they're built like. They're built like a, a, a piece of string. So the 15 millimeters long doesn't give you a lot of, uh, uh, a, a very large uh, eyes and forehead and all that to look uh, to shoot for. Let's zoom in here a little bit. And this is a single shot. I tend to prefer single shots. I don't do a lot of uh, stacked uh, photos. Um, I like working in the field. Um, I don't like working uh, indoors um, or with um, uh, you know, specimens, uh, dead specimens. I like to work with live subjects and capture them in the field in their element. And so um, you don't have as much opportunity to, to do uh, stack photos. Although a lot of people are starting to do that more handheld stack uh, photos. Um, I, like I said, again, I, I find that I, the way that I like to create, um, the way I think artistically, um, I, I prefer to make it about the composition than about the, I start getting real technical when I do stacking and I've done a few 
Um, but I, like I said, I feel like that I start getting way too technical and thinking more about the getting the details uh, perfect than about getting the composition perfect. So just something to think about. That's just a personal preference. If you uh, like stacking and you feel like that the that's how you uh, are more creative, then, then by all means do that. Um, and that new uh, macro rail that Nisi came out with uh, does a phenomenal job with that. Um, the, um, the 90 millimeter uh, plus 58 combo here again for another shot. Um, let you guys look for a quick second at the set camera settings again f10 1 250th that's just kind of my go to one uh, f10 and 1 200 1 250th somewhere in that range is kind of where I start and then just adjust depending on how much uh, extra light I need. Um, close up here this one uh, again was after uh, a rain shower and this one was actually captured in the afternoon um, but he looked like he had a pretty hard day as actually uh, a, a bumblebee there. Um, here's a good example. Um, I talked to you guys earlier about the difference uh, in shooting the wider angle versus the uh, the 90 millimeter. The 50 millimeter by itself here, this was before I had the Nisi. Um, you can see the, uh, the dramatic effect that that wider angle has on the image and how exaggerated the, the face is. It looks uh, much larger compared to the tail. Um, and uh, almost creates uh, what I call a cartoonish kind of look to the subject. And, and it's, it's fun. I, I like, uh, I actually like shooting with the 50 millimeter a lot. It's because it's, it's a little bit slower and clunkier focusing. Um, I don't use it as often um, right away. And, and also with the flying subjects, um, I like to capture flying subjects. So I tend to keep that 90 millimeter on most of the time. But if I've got a stationary subject like this that is fairly large that I want to try to capture the whole thing or that I want to do something creative with the, uh, uh, with the uh, depth of field or with the uh, shooting angle like that, uh, with the focal length uh, is really what I was trying to say there, um, then I'll, I'll put the 50 millimeter on and, uh, and play around with it a little bit like that and see if I, if I like what I uh, create that way. Here's an example of the 50 millimeter with the uh, the Nisi 58 on there. Now, what was interesting about this, I, I was probably two inches away from the subject here for this shot. Um, and so what that did is that you, you guys can kind of see that it's a little bit more backlit. And uh, because the, um, the diffuser ended up actually being a little bit more over and behind the subject than on the front. And so that required definitely playing around with the settings a little bit to get the exposure right the right combination for the face and the background so that the background wouldn't be overly bright and the, the face be too dark. Um, but really came up with a really cool dramatic shot like that. Um, lighting, um, if, you lit, if you've done uh, portrait photography, you know that if you light the subject from the sides like that, you know, you can create a really dramatic, almost spooky kind of look or really dynamic kind of look. So um, that's essentially what it created. All right, so a few uh, final uh, thoughts, um, you know, are to, you know, not, not get yourself uh, handcuffed by, by rules um, or by technical aspects, you know, be appropriately self-critical, but most importantly, create art, you know, um, do have fun with what you're doing uh, and, and, uh, and try to think artistically, ask yourself, you know, are you being creative or are you being technical? And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're focusing, you, the, the technical sides, yes, they do have to be right, but uh, don't let them limit you from uh, getting out there and experimenting. But also the other thing that I, I tell people is to pay attention to, you know, the, the kind of feedback that you get as well. Don't, don't think that just because you're being an artist that you don't need to listen to, to feedback don't use the feedback to um, tell you what type of art you should create, but maybe uh, use the feedback to tell you which of your uh, artistic ventures are more uh, palatable or what your, your niche is. You know, um, that's, that's kind of how, like I told you guys at the very beginning, I, I realized that I just really had a knack for doing uh, pollinators was by listening to the feedback. And instead of uh, 
wasting energy on uh, things that, um, that even though I, I like as much, um, I, I like shooting pollinators and, and dragonflies a lot too. And so I would rather put my energy into something that I just uh, have a, a natural knack for uh, rather than um, the uh, continuing to try to take pictures, especially with the limited time that I have. It's not my, my full-time job. Uh, it's just a, a part-time passion that I, I do. Uh, I have been published, and so I make a little bit of money uh, selling prints as well and all that. But you, you have to, especially if you're wanting to sell your work, if you're wanting to sell your work to magazines, if you're wanting to sell your work as art, you have to pay attention to, you know, what are people looking for. And uh, like I said, don't decide what you're going to shoot based on the feedback, but decide what of the types of things that you love to shoot that you're going to focus on based on the feedback and uh, go with that. So um, my website is pollinatorportraits.com. Uh, you can download pictures there. Uh, my email is jose at pollinatorportraits.com. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, I, I do these webinars um, because I, I love to teach. That was actually my first job out of college. I was a, a high school level teacher for a couple of years. And then I've been a, uh, my current day job is I actually am a gym owner. And uh, to, before becoming a gym owner, I was a personal trainer for quite a few years. I love uh, helping people succeed. I, I like to, to see people achieve their goals. And so I don't ever try to hold anything back. If I've held something back in this webinar, it's just because I forgot to cover it. Uh, but I'm always happy to answer uh, questions. So if there was something that you didn't hear, you know, we'll have a QA and a here at the end, but also uh, shoot me an email and I'm always happy to answer the question if I know uh, the answer. And uh, my Instagram, of course, uh, at jmadimages. Uh, if you're not following me already, please uh, do so. And uh, on Facebook, I'm Pollinator Portraits by J Madrigal. So um, check me out there as well. And uh, with that, Jim, I'll bounce it back over to you and uh, to uh, a little bit of Q&A here. Great. Well, first, I'm going to ask a few questions that were uh, that were coming in as you were talking. All right. Um, what the, f the first couple were from Jim and not me, Jim. Uh, your typical working distance, and I think you covered that pretty well, um, but in general, in general, um, what, where are you usually at? The, how far away from your subject are you in general? Um, so that depends on whether I'm using my telephoto lens or whether I'm using the, uh, the macro lens. Um, with the telephoto lens, uh, part of the reason why I wanted to uh, get the, uh, the 1.4 teleconverter is so that I could get closer to the subject without having to physically get closer. It would just zoom me in more. And uh, the, the minimum uh, focusing distance on that is one meter. So um, I typically try to keep myself about three to six feet away from the subject. Uh, uh, part of it also depends on the size of the subject. If it's a large dragonfly, uh, you know, some dragonflies, uh, the larger uh, North American dragonflies get up to like 60 millimeters in, in length. So they, they get pretty big. That, that one that I showed you before, that's one of the largest ones in the US. And that one uh, grows uh, as big as like 58 millimeters. And so, um, like I said, at at uh, at about five feet away from me, it was almost too big for to get all of it in the in the frame. So, um, but I, I like to obviously being a macro photographer and want, uh, taking pictures of these uh, small insects and wanting to uh, see the details. Um, I, uh, I like to get as close to the subject as I can. So three to six feet is where I like to try to be sweet spot with the, uh, uh telephoto lens. Um, but I'll get as far as 12 feet away, anything beyond about 12 feet away with my types of subjects, um, is not really going to give me enough detail in the subject to, uh, really be worth it. So, um, with some that are a little bit larger, like some of those larger dragonflies, um, I also do, um, uh, hummingbirds hummingbirds are a little you know big enough they're small for a bird but they're big enough that you can be a little bit further away 12 to 15 feet away honestly even if especially if you're doing a full composition um but for the insects uh it's usually three to six feet uh with the telephoto 
with the macro lens, um, I'm anywhere from about six inches away to um, no more than about a, a foot, foot and a half away. Um, now I do actually, one of the things that I like to do, um, if it's a, a stationary subject, if it's a, a dragonfly, for example, perched, um, I'll typically shoot with using autofocus as I'm approaching. I'll take a, a shot, move in a little bit closer. And a lot of times if I'm crawling on the ground, for example, I can't be manually focusing. So that's why I tend to like to shoot autofocus even with uh, this type of situation. Um, I'll be shooting one-handed and, uh, or I'll hold the, the twig that the subject is on with one hand. I'll do that sometimes. But anyway, I'll use autofocus as I'm moving in closer and closer. And then once I get once the subject has allowed me to get in their circle of trust of just, uh, you know, inches uh, away, um, then I'll go ahead and switch to manual focus because that's a little bit more precise as far as making sure that you're nailing it on the eyes uh, as opposed to somewhere else on the subject. So you use um, the, uh, the, the focusing uh, assist. Uh, most cameras have that these days where you get like uh, yellow sparkles or red sparkles or whatever on the whatever is in focus and mm -hmm. uh and so you can utilize that to make sure that you nail the focus on the eyes in manual um but again like i said it if i'm using the uh the nisi on there i'm gonna have to get even closer so you know just uh maybe three to eight inches away is where i'm typically at when i've got the nisi on there so oh, you're covering and, and also the, the whether it's in flight or whether it's perched is going to make a difference so you're, you're covering a lot of ground there right. um one thing that i'll comment about what you said was you also really need to know where the controls on your camera are you need to know where the uh autofocus and manual focus switch is so that you can do that very smoothly and easily yeah um i actually had a question based on a question that passed by me a long a while ago um I um, I know you don't use a tripod, mm -hmm. but do you ever use like a monopod? Um, I'll use a monopod uh, when I'm shooting uh, the uh, uh, the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are uh, like even if you're uh, six to twelve feet away, uh, they're very skittish, and if they see you move, um, they'll uh, they'll take off. Uh, with insects, you don't have to worry about that as much. You can raise the, the camera um, with a flying insect and they're not gonna freak out as long as you do it fairly slowly. Um, but with the, the hummingbirds, I've found that a monopod helps uh, so that I can have it positioned in the right way and then just kind of sway real slowly without you know, making a, a dramatic move. That's interesting, that's interesting. Okay, so another question I've only, the, I've only got a few and then we'll let you guys ask live. Is there a, a particular um, insect identifier manual that you like to use or how do you learn about all the species that you're shooting? Um, I use iNaturalist a lot. Um, I also have a, um, I purchased a field guide uh, for uh, Texas dragonflies. Um, I, there's a book, uh, that I also purchased, um, for bees. It's called, uh, the bees in your backyard. Um, I really like that book. That's a little less of a field guide. It's really more of a book about bees than a, um, uh, uh, but it does have a lot of information about different species and you're able to utilize it, um, fairly well, uh, to help you identify species. Um, but the, the field guide uh, for the dragonflies and the damselflies, I can't remember the name of the guy that, uh, uh, that did, he's the same person, uh, did both of those. And, and that's been super helpful for, uh, for odonates. But, uh, but for bees, like I said, it's a combination of that. And, and then um, I don't have field guides for other insects. So I rely a lot for the other ones. Um, if I do some different spiders or uh, the, uh, you know, just a variety of different types of insects. I'll, I'll utilize iNaturalist. Um, it's also good to have friends. Um, I have uh, a number of friends on Instagram that are um, a little bit more of, uh, of true insect buffs and they, they know uh, entomologists, you know, and they, they know more specifically uh, the species. And so, you know, I don't hesitate to ask. And if I do ask one of them, I'll give them credit. If somebody uh, gives me the uh, the answer to the insect, but if, if I find it on uh, 
on a web search. Um, I'll sometimes mention that, or sometimes I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, write the, the name of the, of the subject without necessarily going into a lot of detail. My, my purpose is, is definitely more artistic than it is scientific. Um, and I'm pretty open about that. I, I don't always necessarily have the exact species. Um, I typically try to at least get the, the family or order of insect um, in the uh, description, um, because I know that that, particularly when you're shooting these types of subjects, the type of followers uh, that you get, a lot of them are very interested in knowing not just, you know, what this uh, animal looks like, but what is it called, you know, and so that they can uh, look for it. So the more information that I can give, the better. Um, but like I said, I, I openly admit that uh, my primary goal is to uh, take pictures that are exciting and that uh, that make people stop and say, wow. And then secondly, to uh, be able to identify them and, um, and know exactly what I've just taken a picture of. Well, there was a uh, viewer named Rory who actually uh, chimed in and said that there's uh, something called Bug Guide. Just bug. Yeah. yeah, there is. I've used uh, Bug Guide as well. Um, uh, I've used uh, some of the uh, some of the universities have some good uh, resources. Um, there's, uh, I think, Oklahoma State University has a really good website with um, a lot of the uh, the insects that are native to uh, Texoma, which is Texas Oklahoma region, um, and uh, A and M as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll typically spend. I used to be able to spend more time. Uh, obviously, with COVID and with uh, being a gym owner, uh, life changed a lot over the last year uh, to where I, I, uh, I haven't had as much free time to be out taking pictures and spending time IDing them and, um, and as much time uh, with all that, what I'm passionate about and enjoy at this point in my life. But um, it's uh, it definitely as things start to normalize again. Uh, that's one of the things that I really hope to be able to do a lot more of is spend a lot more time with the, the research side of things. And then of course, uh, as well, um, uh, with the, you know, the, the Instagram and, and my, my followers there and, and uh, uh, interacting with them. Now, I'm gonna combine a question that a woman named Margaret had with a question that I actually have which is how much post do you do? You take pictures, how much, how much of the images that we're seeing are enhanced by post-production? And my part of the question is, I see that a lot of photographers that shoot digital are shooting, they tend to underexpose so that they can bring the image out from the underexposure, like they underexpose and then the old fashioned thing would be they overdevelop, they bring, they, they shoot and bring stuff out of the shadows. Mm -hmm. So I guess in short, the question is how much post is involved in the images that we're seeing? Um, I always uh, post process. Um, I think one of my favorite uh, sayings uh, from uh, everybody uh, will agree that Ansel Adams is one of the greatest photographers of all time. And uh, his yeah. saying was that um, you, uh, you know, you put the meat on the bones in, in the dark room, you know, that the, the photo is just the skeleton, uh, but you put the meat on the bones in the dark room. And, um, you know, we don't have, uh, we don't rely on dark rooms anymore these days. Uh, we, we use Lightroom and tools like that. And I primarily process in Lightroom. What I don't do really is um, composites. I don't, uh, change the background, um, anything more than what I could do through the basic tools in Lightroom. Um, the, the rare exception that I'll do to that is if I, uh, there's been a couple of times, like I, I had a, a photo used for the front cover of a magazine, um, actually this month in February, uh, it was used in the Netherlands, a photo of a bee, and uh, the, the way that they wanted it cropped um, I needed, I, I didn't have quite enough room at the bottom of it. And so I adjusted the crop and added pixels basically in Photoshop and using the intelligent pixel ad, it made it look like just a continuation of, of the, the background. 
Um, but to me, it wasn't something that, that really, it didn't change the subject uh, of the picture or um, really um, affect the background in a way uh, that was deceitful to the subject or to the, to the viewer. Um, I, I don't, I mean, there, I, I don't want to say that it's uh, necessarily deceitful to do that because if you're honest about that, that's what you're doing, then you can create some really beautiful art that way, uh, uh, compositing uh, multiple pictures. Um, obviously, with landscapers, do that a lot when you do um, the uh, the overexposed, the underexposed, and then the the middle to you know to have to create a composite like that with um, oh the uh, HDR yeah HDR right and and so. Um, again, like I said, for, for me uh, and my style of photography and, and my style of art, I like to capture as much as possible the moment. And, uh, but what I do believe in though is, um, you know, doing your editing in a way that really enhances the, um, what you want the, the viewer to look at. So I tend, I do, uh, bring up the shadows a little bit more and uh, increase the sharpening a little bit more specifically on the subject. Um, I'll also usually amp up the whites. Um, that's one of my uh, editing secrets um, that <laughs> rather than bring up exposure uh, on the subject is that I'll amp up the whites because it, it gives it a lot more pop. Um, and, uh, and then I used to use clarity to do that, but I've found that I, I get a uh, I still add a little bit of clarity, um, but I've found that that by amping up the whites, um, you know, it, it really makes the, the colors more vibrant and uh, makes the subject really pop. So, but there's, you know, I, I always, um, I, I don't have a set recipe either. It, it really just depends on the picture. I, I look at the picture and, and I just immediately start thinking, you know, what, uh, what would really make this image pop? And, and so uh, sometimes I bring up the blacks, uh, almost uh, crank them almost all the way up um, to, uh, to just have a really matte look to the image. Um, sometimes I uh, enhance the color. Sometimes I desaturate. Um, sometimes I uh, do a, a lot of denoising. Sometimes I just do a little bit. Sometimes I enhance sharpening a lot. Sometimes I don't. Um, it just really depends on on the um, the specific image, and that's where where, like I say, you just as an artist have to make your own uh, creative choices. And I don't ever try to tell anybody what they what they should or shouldn't do. Just be honest about what you're doing. You know, don't don't try to pass something off as this was a single shot. Like um, if I had photographed this bee here on this, this final thoughts page and, and a flower separately and then combine them together later in Photoshop, then I would feel like it was deceitful to try to say that this was a single shot, but I, I didn't do that. So I always try to capture my photos um, or I always capture my photos. I should not try to, I, that's, that's what I do. I, I do one shot and, uh, and I don't, um, uh, composite things. Like I said, I'll clean it up. I'll remove, uh, yeah, that's another thing that you have to do in post. You have to remove specks of dust because you invariably end up with uh, specks of dust on the lens uh, out in the field. And so uh, that'll show up in the, in the image. Um, sometimes, like I've had some people um, critique my work of like, there's sometimes that I leave noise in there intentionally because I like the, the, the texture that it adds. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, so it just, well, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was, I would say it's kind of like grain. Yeah. Well, I want to do this. I'd like to, I'd like to invite people at this point, if you want to turn your mics on and your cameras on and say hi and ask questions directly, um, we want to wrap it up relatively soon. So please, if you have questions, turn on your mic, turn, turn on your camera, ask the question then turn it back off and we'll let the next person do it. And uh, let's see what happens. We're trying to do this more. All right. To let people ask their own questions rather than me hogging all the time. 
Well, if everyone's being shy, I'll ask another question that came through on the. Sorry, I got a train going by. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm gonna go. That's a, that's a, <laughs> You're okay. that in the background. Um, do you uh do you shoot in burst mode? Do you do you um when you're when you're going in for the shot, do you do you use the burst mode of your camera to shoot a, a bunch of photographs, uh, a bunch of images in a row, so that you'll capture the, so that hopefully in that burst you capture the image you want? Yes, yes, I do that. Um, definitely with natural light, I tend to do that because, like I mentioned earlier. Um, especially with a, even when a subject is hovering, they, they don't hover just in one spot and just hold steady right there. They're bouncing around a little bit. And the difference between a shot that is um, a money shot and one that is an almost shot can be just one or two millimeters. And so, um, yeah, I'll typically rattle off anywhere from three to five shots in burst mode like that uh, when I'm shooting with natural light. When I'm shooting with, uh, with flash, um, I've, I've tried that, but again, I, I was doing, when I've done that, I've done that, um, you, you need to make sure that your flash power is low enough to be able to, uh, handle that. And, and also, uh, you have to be thinking that what your goal is, is to make a, uh, a stacked image of a focus stacked image. And, um, I've done a number of subjects like that and then just ended up um, not using them just because like I said, it takes, it's, a, it's very tedious, very technical uh, work to stack images. Uh, even with good software, you still have to go back through and clean it up and make sure yeah, that yeah. it doesn't do some. You either wrong. like doing it or you don't like doing it. It, it. it is a very arduous thing, even with, even with software assistance it is. Now, as far as using the flash code, do you just go TTL with the flash or do you, do you, calculate a manual exposure with the flash no i uh i just uh, adjust uh based on uh, how much light i want I, I put it in manual um i've I, again ttl is is one of those things that that like auto mode on the camera um kind of lets the the flash decide how much it wants to light it up and uh, i prefer to control that although i do tend to always leave it at about between 1 8 and 1 16th power um, so, uh, but like I said, I, I like to maintain control of that. So I, I'll, I'll do that in manual. Cool. All right. Well, I have covered, I have covered the, uh, on the flash issue, do you, um, typically do high speed flash or do you use it as the, uh, six speed of your camera? I mean, I've been trying to break it to you all day. So because I'm, I'm, Sorry, I'm hearing something Stay going here. in the background. Yeah, someone please turn their mic off and uh, let him ask, answer the question. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. It's just a year. My freshman year, you'll be fine. <laughs> All right, we got, we're getting bombed there. But anyway, uh, I'll try to answer it here. Um, so I, I, sometimes I'll use the, the high speed sync, um, but since, especially um, since I'm typically uh with, with this um i had i uh, had to use high speed sync a lot more when i had the uh the diy diffuser that i had before because i didn't get as much um light but since switching to the ak uh, diffuser i get really really bright light even at 1 16th uh power and so i can have the the uh the shutter speed uh slower and really get the results that i want that way and so if you're below one two fiftieth of a second, you don't need high speed uh, sync anyway. So, um, so the answer is um, I, I'm not afraid to use it, but I don't typically use it just because I I don't I don't need to. Great, um, Jose. Obviously, capturing the the insects flying is pretty cool. What shutter speed is kind of your desired shutter speed to to capture them moving because I assume you want to try and show some movement in the wings as well um yeah sometimes I actually personally like uh cap freezing the the wings um and uh maybe with just a little bit of blur if they're too much of a blur um you can definitely get a shot where you can barely even tell that there's wings there and so um 
I've, I've found that, that kind of that sweet spot, like I said, is about for natural light is about one twelve fiftieth to uh, one sixteen hundredth. And I know that those shutter speeds vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but on Sony one twelve fiftieth to one sixteen hundredth is, uh, is kind of that, that's uh, sweet spot where I get still a little bit of blur, uh, where you can tell that it's, it's live, but it's, it's frozen enough that you can see some good details in the wings. Um, and then, um, like I said, when, with, when shooting with flash, um, I let the flash uh, do that by uh, shooting at faster than about one eighth and, uh, and two thirds of a stop um, uh, power. Um, I'm typically getting a flash duration that's uh, fast enough to freeze the, the, uh, the action uh, that way. And yeah. like I said, as long as no ambient light is getting on the subject and only the flash is lighting up the subject, then um, I'll freeze the subject completely that way. So I, I, for we'll that, um, like I had mentioned earlier, when I'm shooting that way, um, I'm shooting at a shutter speed that I would with normal macro, which is anywhere between about one one twenty fifth and one two fiftieth of a second, just depending on how much light I need. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're good. Um, everyone, a lot of people hung in there right till the end. And uh, I really appreciate it. You know, you're one of my favorite speakers and uh, I'm so glad to have you back. And you know what, next time, uh, maybe we get some pictures of uh, insects that don't fly. You're talking about spiders and stuff. I haven't seen it. <laughs> I mean, I have seen them on your, on your uh, Instagram feed, but they're not in your presentation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I try to make this, um, most of my followers on Instagram um, that know me for the, the flying insects, that's definitely the thing that is, tends to be um, the, the more, the, the thing that I'm able to do that a lot of other people aren't able to do. And so I've, I've always wanted to kind of make that the focus of, of what I teach in my, in my webinars. Yeah. But I, I definitely think that, um, you know, I, I want to also uh, cover other subjects a little bit more. Um, I think that if I uh, could make uh, one a little bit more going into um, how the different types of diffusers that you can use and how they, you know, are going to light up the subject differently and why you want to use a diffuser and just really focus on with, like you're saying, with still subjects and, uh, and maybe, uh, uh, like I said, just talk a little bit more about um, the different types of lighting setups, you know, that, that would be good. I, as I said, this, this year, I wanna try to do some stuff with strobes, um, try to do some stuff with different light setups. So uh, definitely um, expect me to be uh, creating a, uh, a workshop based around that. And, and as well, my editing, um, obviously that question has come up um, with each of my webinars. I think people have asked, you know, how much editing I do I think it would be really useful to uh, take somebody on a walkthrough of how I process a picture, how I uh, sharpen, how I remove noise, how I think in terms of what I'm trying to do uh, with an image, show some before and afters of uh, before processing and after processing so people can get an idea of, uh, of just how much uh, uh, I do from, from beginning to end and why. Well, let's do it. Hey, uh, Andrew, can we get up the slide of the uh, of the coupon again? Hopefully you're still there. Do I need to stop sharing mine in order to get that? Uh, maybe, yes, if you don't mind. There we go. So uh, for those of you who are still remaining, there is discount available for anything from uh, Nisi or from our new brand Explorer. 15% uh, off, uh, just use the coupon code that's there, jot it down. It'll also be available on the replay. Jose, I can't thank you enough. It's always a pleasure. I know we have one more in the can coming up at some point, so we'll be in touch about that. And uh, also, um, I know you're gonna be testing out a few, a few of these uh, Explorer pieces for us, so mm -hmm. can't wait to see what you've got there. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to having, uh, I, I've always liked the freedom of shooting um, uh, handheld. Um, I've, I've hated, which is like, 
you know, you asked earlier if I ever use a monopod and I can use that because it, it feels more like handheld. Uh, a tripod, when you have a big giant tripod, I just, I feel like it, it restricts my ability to move around and follow the subject. Um, but a small um, like tabletop type of tripod is something that I've been thinking about for a while. So yeah, I would definitely let, like to, like to try that out try and see how that, that feels in the field. Yeah, we're gonna let you try ours and it's pretty nifty. I, I already uh, I already have my eye on one myself. I, it would be, you'll like it a lot. All right, well, I, uh, I know I'll be talking to you soon. Everybody else, thank you very much. Next week, uh, we have a incredible landscape photographer named Joshua White out of Utah. And uh, I hope we'll be, you'll be joining us for that. Um, and we're just gonna keep these webinars rolling. So uh, keep an eye on our Instagram feed, keep an eye on our website and um, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you very much. I'm gonna sign off. Jose. Awesome. I'm glad everything's good with you and I'll talk to you during the week. Thank you, Jim. All right. See Thank you soon. Bye-bye.